chapter review time. So our five good shortcuts were side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, 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 side, and HL, which is really ASS in disguise, and we'll talk more about HL when it's good and when it's bad. Now, angle, side, angle versus angle, angle, side. Some of you are still a little leery about the differences between these two. Yes, they both have two A's, and yes, they both have one S, but the location of the S is important. So it's where that side is located at. If it's in between the two marked angles, then it's included. And then it's angle, side, angle. And if our side that's marked is not in between the two angles, then it's not included, and then it's angle, angle, side. So if the S is not in between the two A's, it's angle, angle, side, just like our picture and the ordering of AAS is matching up there. Likewise, this is angle, side, angle, because the side is right in between the two A's. So, is the side that's marked as congruent in between the two marked angles? If it's yes, then it's angle, side, angle. If your answer is no, it's angle, angle, side. Now, for HL, when we have a good ASS versus a bad ASS. So, our key was the A in both cases. When the angle was... 90 degrees, then the ASS is a must, and we call it no longer ASS, but RHL. And when the A is not equal to 90 degrees, then our ASS is a bust, which means it doesn't work. It's not a good shortcut. So this is a good shortcut because it's ASS and we have 90 degree angles. This is ASS, but these angles are not known to be 90 degrees, so it is not HL. Theorem 4.1, most of you are getting good with this, where you know that Theorem 4.1, what it applies to directly, and it only applies to the angles. If two sets of angles are congruent between two triangles, then the third set of angles must be congruent between those two triangles, because all three angles in both triangles must add to be specifically 180 degrees. So Theorem 4.1 does not apply to side lengths. Just because you have two sets of congruent sides in a triangle doesn't mean that the third set of sides must be congruent. Because the perimeter, if you add up all three sides of a triangle, it doesn't have to equal a specific number, like angles have to add up to be 180. So theorem 4.1, again, only applies to angles and not to sides. Now the two things in proofs that you have to mark will be vertical angles and reflexive sides. Okay, so you've got one thing that you'll mark that involves angles and one thing that you'll mark that involves sides. Now, there are other things that you would have to mark, uh, but it's not always present in certain problems. For example, if we had parallel lines, you would be in charge of marking, you know, the alternate interior or the corresponding or whatever angles you would have in that specific problem. But these are the two major things that you have to mark. So for this example, are the triangles congruent? Well, I can see in this one, I've got angle side side, and this is the good angle side side. So this is showing HL, but is this triangle showing HL? Well, I'm just missing the angle, but can I show that this angle should be the same as that angle? And yeah, because they're vertical angles, so they must be congruent. So yes, those triangles are congruent by HL. And what else do you know is also true? Well, at this point, they're asking for CPCTC information. We need to match up our corresponding parts of our congruent triangles to say that they are congruent. So the other things that are congruent that weren't marked is we now know by CPCTC that AB must be congruent to BD. We also know that angle A must be congruent to angle D. And we also know that angle E must be congruent to angle C. So there are three things that we can deduce with CPCTC because they represent corresponding parts of congruent triangles and therefore they must be congruent. So here's one proof that we'll look at, the only proof really we'll look at here. But if I wanted to prove that sides were parallel, I want to prove that MJ is parallel to LK. And in the last chapter we talked about how to prove that uh, sides or lines were parallel. We had to use a converse of type of statement. So I need to show that certain angles using those two lines have a special relationship. 
And again, I said nine times out of 10, we're gonna be looking for alternate interior angles. So if I wanna show these two lines are parallel, I'm probably gonna be using this as my transversal, and you might go, well, hey, look, those are alternate interior, they're congruent, so those lines are parallel. Not quite, these alternate interior angles use these two lines, ML and JK. So we can say that they're parallel, but we can't say that MJ and LK are parallel. What we need to show is that these angles, uh, JMK and LKM, if we can show these two angles are congruent, then we have parallel lines. So that's gonna be our goal. If we can show those are equal, we're good to go. So it says, use the info in the picture as you're given. So we'll just say, oh, there's some given stuff. And of course you would write this out in your actual proof, but just to make this video short, and you know what I mean by given stuff and given, what else do we know is true? Well, we've got this reflexive side. So MK is congruent to MK by reflexive PC for me, since I use congruent symbol. And now I notice that both triangles have the same side angle side. So I know these triangles are now congruent, so I'll call the bottom one JKM, and I'll call the top one LMK. And I know they're congruent by side angle side. So now that I know those triangles are congruent, I can talk about anything else that wasn't marked. And what is not marked that I really want to see marked so I can say that lines are congruent. And that was that this angle and this angle are now congruent. So I have to state that those angles are congruent. So angle JMK, I now know is congruent to LKM. And I know that's true because of CPCTC. You can only use CPCTC to say that angles and sides are congruent. That's it. You can't say uh, something is being bisected or something's a midpoint because of CPCTC. You have to tell me the lengths or the angles that are congruent by CPCTC to say then that other things are bisected or midpoints. So now that I know those two angles are congruent, those are my alternate interior that I needed to see being congruent, and they are, so now I may conclude, finally, that MJ, the left side, is parallel to the right side by the converse of, and then what type of angles did I just show were congruent? They were alternate interior angles theorem. And we're done. So some stuff from last chapter is seeping into this chapter still. Now let's talk about besides our congruent triangle stuff, we also talked about isosceles and equilateral triangles and some other things about triangles. So the isosceles triangle theorem and the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem, all we had here was that if we had an isosceles triangle, then the base angles, which were the two angles that were opposite our two congruent sides, are also congruent. And that specifically for proof purposes was called the isosceles triangle theorem. We also knew that if our base angles were congruent, that that meant that the two sides opposite of those angles must also be congruent. And that's just the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem. So these two things work forwards and backwards. If you have congruent legs, you have congruent base angles. If you have congruent base angles, you have congruent legs. And all of that similarly worked for equilateral triangles. If a triangle is equilateral, it's also equiangular. And if a triangle is equiangular, it must also be equilateral. Last but not least, we talked about the relationships within triangles. So we had the larger the angle, so if we knew that y was our largest angle, then the side opposite of that angle, which would be xz, would be the longest side. And vice versa, the smaller the side, the smaller the angle. Uh, we could also talk about it in terms of the angles in terms of the sides, just like the sides in terms of the angles. There's a two-way relationship there. So really on this arrow, I could have it pointing in either direction. Large will match up with large. Largest side matches up with largest angle. Then we also talked about the triangle inequality theorem, which was just that the sum of the two shortest sides must be greater than the third side. Now the way the book states it is, the sum of the lengths of any two sides, we really want to say the shortest two sides. The sum of the lengths of the two shortest sides, we'll say, of a triangle is greater than the length of the largest. Now, we could state it that way, 
the way that the book does, but then you're having to look at three uh, inequalities versus just one. So we could just look at it like this. So the sum of the two shorter guys have to team up and beat the largest guy for it to really be a triangle. If it's not true, if the sum of the two smaller sides is not greater than the largest side, then it doesn't make a triangle. And the next one. Now the last problem I want to do is kind of related to your portfolio questions. And this doesn't look exactly like a uh, factoring trinomial problem. But what you might have to do is move things around so that everything's lined up. Okay, So the x squared is over on the right side and it's positive, which is a good thing. So what I'm going to do is move everything on the left side, which is just the 4x, and move it over with everything else on the right side. So I'm going to subtract 4x over so that I end up with 0 on the left. And now out of these three terms, there's no like terms. So I'm going to start with the highest power, which is x squared, followed up by my minus 4x, and then the constant minus 21. Now we can look at this as a factoring a trinomial problem. So we need two binomials that have an x and an x, and we need two numbers that multiply to be negative 21, but at the same time they need to add to be negative 4. Well, 21, I can think of 7 and 3. So either the 7 is negative or the 3 is negative. In both of those cases, I get negative 21. But now when I add them, this gives me negative 4 and this gives me positive 4. Okay, I don't know what in the world that is, but that shouldn't be there. Um, so I want the one that gave me negative 4 because that was what I was looking for, two numbers that multiply to be negative 4. So here are my two numbers of interest, negative 7, and positive 3. Now, since I need to solve for this, I mentioned earlier that all we have to do at this point, and I don't really need the parentheses, is we need to take each parenthesis, the x minus 7, and set it equal to 0, and take the other parenthesis, the x plus 3, and set it equal to 0, and solve for x. So we get that x is 7, or x is negative 3. And that would be my answer. Now here's the thing to keep in mind. These are good algebraic answers, but if this was a geometry problem, for instance, and let's say I had vertical angles, and this angle was 4x, and this angle was x squared minus 21, okay? Now I've got some meaning here. If I were to plug 7 in, I would get that this is 28 degrees. This would be 49 minus 21, which is 28 degrees, and that works out, okay? But think about what would happen if I plugged in negative 3. If I plug in negative 3 for x, this gives me negative 12 degrees. And can we have a negative degree value in geometry? No, we cannot. And if I plug negative 3 over here, I'd get negative 12 degrees. Now, if this was a geometry problem, we would say negative 3 isn't a good geometry answer. It's a good algebra answer, but it really depends on if you're given just an algebra problem that looks like this, or if I actually had this be a geometry problem that you had to solve algebraically. Okay? Now this answer is what we would call an extraneous answer. Okay? It's an answer. It's an answer algebraically, but geometrically it just doesn't work. So make sure you remember how to do your factoring of trinomials because you will see something like it on the test. And you might have to rearrange it to make it pretty. And keep in mind that once you get your answers, that maybe both of them work, but maybe not. Okay, And you might be saying, well, one of them's not going to work and one of them will always work. Or negative answers will never work. That's not necessarily true. You have to take both answers, plug it back in, and see if you get positive results back. Because I have seen negative answers that when you plug them back in, do in fact give you positive results. And so you technically have two good answers that could work. And that's all for the chapter review. We'll hope you guys study up and kick butt on that test tomorrow.